Dr. Mindy here, and welcome to Resetter TV, episode five. In this episode, I interview Keith Bell, who is the founder of The Gut Club. So go check out his, he's got a Facebook page, he's got a website, go check out his information. What I love about him is that he is vetting the science on the microbiome. He has some of the best research articles that are now coming out telling, showing us how powerful your gut bacteria is for your overall health. So he and I have a great discussion about mood and um, losing weight and energy. And I mean, anything you wanna know about the microbiome, we discussed in this episode. So um, this guy's a genius and he's got some great resources. So I hope you enjoy it. Okay, Resetters, Dr. Mindy here. And as many of you know, I like to talk about a lot of subjects, but I'm gonna say that the microbiome may be my favorite topic to talk about. So I have brought on one of the top experts that I consider the top experts uh, in the world. I mean, I don't know how you refer to yourself, Keith, but if you're not familiar with Keith Bell, he has an amazing Facebook page called The Gut Club, and he is bringing the science on the micro microbiome to the masses. So we're here today with Keith to talk about what science is teaching us, what we're learning about how important our bacteria is for our overall health. So welcome, Keith. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's a quite an honor. And, and um, you know, I have to say the first time I I became aware of the Resetter Tribe and watched your videos. I felt like you were, you know, you know, one of my family members. And I know I love the way you condense information and I can see how you simplify things for people. It's really necessary because no one can remember all this information so so well. So you're, you know, I, I realize that underneath that enthusiasm is a bubbling, you know, not just you know, it, it's it's a lot of thought. That goes into yeah. that. So I, yeah. I have to pass off to you, Dr. Mayer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You know, I think one of the beautiful things, and you're probably finding this in the gut club, of having a lot of people online communicating with you, is you see where people are getting stuck. And mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to the microbiome, people are, there's so much information, they don't know what to believe, they don't know where to go. So I think what, what is really important as we launch into this conversation is how do we simplify this for people? What do people need to know? Because you could end up down a rabbit hole of scientific research on the microbiome. So- Totally, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm always going down these rabbit holes and I have to admit, <laughs> I have to admit that, you know, you know, more than half the reason I even started the Gut Club was a way to catalog all this information that I couldn't possibly remember. So I'm constantly going back. Um, luckily, um, when it comes to the Facebook page, they offer a very good uh, way for me to search my my history. And yeah. I, I'm constantly relearning things that, that I already learned. There's no way you can remember all this material. And, you know, yeah. not that anywhere close to Albert Einstein, but even he was, you know, of the mind that he would never try to remember anything that he could possibly look up later. So yeah. he would oh, his mind. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I like to think of um, this Facebook page not only as a way to educate, but it's sort of a public diary where mm -hmm. I'm able to interact with people and who are all learning aloud. I'm 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 right there with everybody. And um, it's yeah. And why don't we start there? Um, you know, one to preface the microbiome. I think what's really important for people to understand is that it is a brand new field of science. And we used to think that it was genes that ran our bodies, but we're only about 10% uh, human cells and we're like 90% bacteria. So we're just at the tip of the iceberg of understanding what the bacteria world and the good bacteria does for our body. So I, I wanna first give you kudos for the Gut Club. If you guys are not familiar with the Gut Club, please, please, please go check it out. If you wanna know science on the microbiome and almost anything, <laughs> Uh, Keith has got it on his on on the uh, Facebook page. So why don't we start with this, Keith? Tell us how you how you came about the gut the gut club, um, and what the the principle and the mission of the gut club is. Okay, great. Before I do that, I just want to address that ninety percent ten percent figure. That's yes. been recently revised. Now there's a, a school of thought saying it's more more like fifty fifty. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that 
that gives our, our egos a chance to uh, to work <laughs> a little yeah. bit better. Um, and but, but now here's where my brain goes. So what what's controlling what? What 50% is controlling? So I, from the yep. research I've seen, the bacteria are controlling the human cells. They have a, a large impact on those cells. Totally. And, and um, I like to think of myself as a walking compost heap. And, <laughs> and it's my responsibility and everyone's responsibility to keep this in mind and do everything we can to stay in balance. And so that's yep. why I view the gut club really as an environmental issue. I'm, I, I, it's a form of environmental activism actually, yeah. because, because the gut yeah. is actually yeah. an environmental issue of the highest order. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we're only becoming, you know, keenly aware of this. It's, it's, it's actually painfully aware. And um, most science that's even still being published has a sterile health construct. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, personally, I derive some, some joy, maybe a little too much joy in pointing out that, that sterile health construct. And, yeah. um, and so the Gut Club started in 2016. And there are some roots um, in it when it comes to fasting. Uh, oh, I love it. Yeah, uh, I'll explain you know, the, the timeline. In the 1980s, I was actually a, a UNICEF um, spokesperson on the NPR affiliate in Chicago for the annual release of the State, State of the World's uh, Children Report. So I've always had an interest in health and particular child health um, and, and you know, by, by trade, I'm in the environmental field. So mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm marrying those interests. I but, love that. But from a personal standpoint, um, back in 2008, our family dog began having a, a seizure disorder. And, you know, I like to, you know, first say that I can't imagine any family with a child going through this mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. as excruciating as it was with a dog. Um, mm -hmm. I heard eight uh, veterinarians and a neurologist, and mm -hmm. all wanted to treat the problem from the neck up. Mm -hmm. um, I was finally able to control her uh, seizure disorder by treating her gut, and it never would work in order to halt what's called a seizure cluster. It, mm -hmm. it, would, never, it would never work um, because it's like trying to halt a freight train unless I also fasted her um, at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I was doing things. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I um, prior to fasting and coming to the information on fasting, I was really my practice was really focused on the gut microbiome and, and helping gut problems. Mm -hmm. And when I married those two, and we can talk more on the science of that. But when I married those two, meaning I got my patients who had digestive issues to really understand the world of fasting it is, it's incredible what happens to the microbiome when you fast, both from an area of killing pathogens, but also from growing good bacteria. It is like a key tool. And, and I think for my resetters, it would be a really cool topic um, to talk about because we get that all the time on the resetter page. You know, where if I have this digestive problem, if I'm bloating, what does that mean? And fasting is it, it's not always as simple as throwing a probiotic at these cases that fasting yeah. has to be in your toolbox. Right. And, and it has to be personalized. One of the one of the things mm -hmm. that um, that we're doing with the gut club is we have a closed group on Facebook now with about thirty five hundred people. It's called the gut club stool test discussion I group. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. And this is a way to help people interpret uh, interpret their stool tests. Um, and we're doing it as a group. There's a lot of power in this group because we have um, a mix of practitioners and um, and people, uh, caregivers, and people themselves who are suffering imbalance. And uh, these stool tests uh, can be quite powerful. I, you know, you say that all the microbiome research is quite new. And a lot of people are, you know, saying, oh, it's too new. We, we just don't know enough. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not actionable. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and to them, I say, you know, there has been so much scientific research published in the last 10 years that it's enough to sink a Navy ship. And, um, and <laughs> probably some of the best science ever produced. And um, you need to get on this wagon. Uh, yeah. don't, don't, don't tell me there's not enough information. There's more than enough information to know um, what – uh, a healthy microbial balance looks like. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's a beautiful reframe. You're right. We do know a ton. And we're, I can promise you 10 years from now, 
it will we'll know even more and we'll just get deeper and deeper with our understanding. So um, let's start with this, just because you know how I like to simplify information and this is not a simple topic. Um, mm -hmm. if, I, if I didn't know anything about the microbiome in today's world, and I met you, I was standing in line in the grocery store and I found out you were a microbiome expert. What would be like the top three things that people need to know about what's happening to their gut bacteria and to their microbiome today. What store is this we're talking about? <laughs> okay, we're we're in uh, we're in Whole Foods. <laughs> oh, Whole Foods. Weren't they recently? We're actually standing at the probiotic. We're standing at the probiotic aisle, looking at all the probiotics. Wait, weren't weren't they just uh, purchased by Amazon last year? Is that right? Yeah, that's true. They were. Oh. They were. <laughs> Did you hear Amazon um, maybe censoring a lot of uh, uh, the well? You know, in fact, today I'd like to talk a little bit later about autism because it happens yes. to be World Autism Awareness Day. Yes, uh, definitely. So we, we can talk about that in context of the gut-brain connection. And, Perfect. Uh, and we have a project called the Microbiome Vaccine Safety Project. Uh, we can talk about that a little later. But Amazon yeah. has been in the news recently and um, about uh, censoring um, some of the uh, the goods and services regarding. Um, vaccination it's it's yeah. a, it's, yeah. it's it's really sad it's really sad and it we should definitely uh address that and and put it in the context of toxicity i think what what you started off by saying was so powerful is is the environmental impact that and, and on our microbiome i think that's really a big picture thought that we need to have is that we are living in a different world today and it's the microbiome that's struggling. So, so go with yeah. that. Yeah, and there's, and you know what? There's not even that much research talking about it yet. Because, mm -hmm. for instance, if you were to uh, talk to any doctor or look up whether or not diabetes, for instance, which is a global scourge, it's uh, an epidemic that's poised to cripple economies of nations based on the uh, cost of healthcare. You know, people are not even accepting that it's about gut dysbiosis. You know, diabetes. Yeah. So, yep. you know, but, yeah. but there's plenty of evidence, um, yeah. and you know, people think, oh, it's not causal. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, yeah. Sooner or later, you have to jump off the fence. And yeah. Um, yeah. So, so um, yeah. So give me give me kind of an overview. Where do we sit today with the microbiome, and how is it affecting our health? Well, you know, recently I've been focusing on um, on the microbes that are located. And, and living in the mucus of our intestines mm -hmm. and how how there's that crosstalk between the microbes that are living there and the cells of the intestinal lining that are producing that mucus. And mm -hmm. in fact, from an environmental standpoint, there's recently been published a paper where they're zeroing in on that community that's living in, in, that, in that mucus. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, a couple of years ago, um, there were papers put out saying that if you don't eat fiber, then you won't have the mucus required to feed those microbes. And then guess what? They will have nothing to eat but you. They will actually mm -hmm. eat your cells. Interesting. And so, um, you know, that's why that's why fiber is pretty important. And, mm -hmm. and that affects both diabetes and celiac disease. You know, celiac disease was once considered a genetic disease, but, you know, in fact, probiotics were shunned um, by the celiac industry. I got kicked off of a fa Facebook group, um, a research group for even suggesting that we need to start looking at probiotics. That was several years ago. Um, so because they wanted to sell their genetic testing. Mm -hmm. But the fact is with celiac disease, it's something like 40% of Americans carry the genes, but only 1% suffer and the, um, you know the difference being proteobacteria, mm. and that's that's one of the gram-negative bacterial families that can wreak havoc. Um, e. coli is in that is in that mm. group. Interesting. So, so you know, I like to focus on protective bacteria, whether they're reduced or absent. There are other people that think it's all about microbial diversity, and the more mm -hmm. the merrier. Um, mm -hmm. I like to think uh, that diversity is overrated and um, and it's really about the missing protective bacteria. Yeah, yeah. 
And and just so we so the audience, because we have all different levels of understanding here, the way that I always explain it is that you've got good bacteria in your gut and you've got bad bacteria. And I think one one of the things that has really happened is that we've been so focused on killing the bad, but the protective, the good really needs to be grown and nurtured and understood better. And I always tell my patients, think of it like a little pet. It's a pet that's inside of you. And if you don't feed it, it's going to die. And this pet's going to make you happy. It's going to give you a strong immune system. It's going to give you energy. It's going to help you lose weight. Like this is the most amazing pet ever. But what are you doing every day to feed it? So talk a little bit about the protective. I think that's a really important point. Well, first of all, I have a little expression. I like to say, you, know, you can't kill your way to good health. Yeah, that's I, good. I love that. I learned I learned that through trials and you know tribulations going back to 2008 with, with this dog. I was of that mindset, kill, kill. Mm -hmm. It never worked until I finally realized you have to add life. Mm. And um, you know, and you know, back to uh, World Autism Awareness Day. You know, people you know are using things like probiotic enema and FMV, mm. um, fecal microbiota transplant um, yep. in order to balance microbes. And they're successful in attenuating autistic symptoms. It's about adding life. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to um, antibiotics, uh, they've done a lot of damage to people and people don't bounce back from it. And you yep. can see from the uh, stool test uh, charts, especially when they're taking, when they have a history of something like Cipro, it's leveling the protective butyrate producing clostridia, the lactobacilli, bifidobacteria. These are all the protective microbes, acromantia. And you can see a pattern just looking at the stool test results and the people are suffering yeah. um, because of that. Yeah, so, and I, I, just to give people some context with that, uh, you know, one of the books that really opened my eyes is Missing Microbes by Dr. Blazer, I assume you've read that. Um, and they were, he talks in that book about how, because we've been such an antibiotic focused world and not just in the antibiotics we're taking, but we're, it's in our lotions, it's in our mouthwashes, it's in our food, that we literally are killing all these good bacteria. Trying, I love that way, you can't kill yourself to good health. Like, I love that idea. So I think what what we have to understand is that we've done so much killing that these good bacteria are so deficient. And we're now leading to things like autism, that we're seeing that there's a connection between those good bacteria and mental health and uh, learning disorders. And I mean, you name it, there is a deficiency in those good bacteria. Yeah. And from an environmental standpoint, one of the big red flags um, is uh, glyphosate. Have you been following the Monsanto cancer trials? Uh, um, I followed the guy who won the big lawsuit. Um, yeah. yeah, that was, yeah. I mean, um, I've been following Stephanie Sneff's work um, for a long time. Glyphosate mm -hmm. is, is uh, yes, it's like beyond a problem. Like it's bigger than a problem. It is literally uh, killing us. And uh, yes, so I'm very familiar with that. Yeah, it's very there was uh, just a second trial where the jury ruled in favor of the plaintiff just in the last couple of days. Oh, uh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. They, they, that was in San Fran too. Um, yeah. And they, um, they awarded um, this man suffering um, lymphoma, I think it was yeah. uh, $80 million. Um, yeah. And that would be under appeal. Um, but the lawyers, you know, for those cases, they still haven't, um, to my knowledge, brought to the jury the ample evidence that cancer, in particular lymphoma, there are several papers, I have a collection of them, where uh, lymphoma is caused by gut dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. Microbes cause, cause lymphoma. And if you, if you put two and two together and look at the research, which I also have a collection of, and it's posted on the Gut Club, um, where um, you know, the, the chemical glyphosate selectively inhibits and kills bifidobacteria, which is our most protective mm. microbe, or, or mm. one of our most protective microbes. And when you think about how that family of bacteria makes up 80% or more of the healthy breastfed infant gut, mm -hmm. you start to realize, you know, glyphosate may be causing generational harm because, mm -hmm. you know, because 
the, the babies are born um, and they pick up microbes, of course, through the birth canal. But what is, what is now also being rapidly accepted is colonization in the womb. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there are still some holdouts out there that believe, oh, no, it's, there's just not enough you know, evidence of that. But there's plenty of evidence. And yeah, we. Uh, I talk a lot in, in my videos and with my clients about the passing down of toxins and that lead and mercury and, and heavy metals get passed down through the generation. But we do also hand off our microbiome. And Martin Blazer talks about that in the in the missing microbes. And mm -hmm. I think that's where and I know you're in the same alignment of this is like this is where my mind just gets blown because if we don't get a handle on this, each generation is going to come in with a more deficient microbiome and a higher toxic load. And I have no idea what's going to happen to the human race if we don't come after we don't start detoxing and start repairing the microbiome. Those two things, in my opinion, need to be at the forefront of every health plan at this point. Yeah. And, and if we wanted to, we could get down um, and depressed about about that information. We could. <laughs> we could. Yeah, on the other side of the coin, we should celebrate this newfound awareness. Great and, reframe, yes. Uh, there's so much excitement um, when I try to, well, I try to convey that um, because we're, what we're trying to do is offer a solution to mm -hmm. the problem. There never was one before. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and this is um, basically uh, getting humanity to become, become, you know, as corny as this may seem, connected with the web of life mm -hmm. and that's a pretty big deal and that's that becomes more than just science then yeah. we're delving into um you know into almost religion um right. in a sense, yeah. You know? yeah well i i still find keith that so many people don't aren't even aware it's a problem so i think that's there is a, a waking up which is great and i and i'm so grateful i agree with you i'm so grateful for that so once you wake up to the problem now, okay, what's the solution look like? And, and when it comes to the microbiome, what I love is you have solutions like fasting that will help, but then you also have solutions like food. So let's talk, let's launch into that a little bit because I know my resetters debate this all the time. What, what, uh, what foods can we start to eat and bring into our diet? You talked about fiber so we can grow these protective bacteria. Yeah, uh, before we get into that, I just want to say quickly, uh -huh. Only half the world has internet access. So we've got our work cut out for us. Interesting, so interesting. That's, that puts things in perspective. And in fact, most of these diseases we're talking about, the non-communicable diseases, NCDs, are suffered in the developing world. In yeah. fact, you know, you know, you talk about World Autism Awareness Day. Um, I read recently that 80% um, of those with ASD are in the de developing world. We think it's a problem here. But, wow. and the same is true of, of epilepsy. Those numbers correspond. Wow. Um, and it just so happens that it could be the same mechanisms, you know, you have you know, between autism and epilepsy. My, my platform for learning about these things was epilepsy. And mm. um, because seizure is such a, and we have the gut brain epilepsy project also. Uh, mm. on, uh, because seizure is uh, a symptom of so many diseases, it was a good way for me to learn. Um, and I've been promoting the idea that there's gut origin of uh, seizure activity. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and so, and so that, yeah, that got me to learn about fasting, of course, and the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. And you know, several years ago, there were, there were hardly any research papers talking about the mechanism behind the ketogenic diet yeah. being, being about flora shift. Right. But, but in the last couple of years, that's really rapidly ga gaining um, acceptance. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just got done listening to Dominic D'Agostino at a conference and his yeah. research is pretty Im impressive on the ketogenic diet. So, um, yeah. but let's launch into food. Cause like, I'll give you an example. Um, Sequoia and I had a really intense multi-day discussion about potatoes that you posted an article on the gut club saying that showing that potatoes gets into the lower intestine and can feed the, the good bacteria in there. And it, it, it created an interesting dialogue because in the ketogenic world, we typically don't eat potatoes. Although you, you'll know, you probably know that I'm a fan of variation of cycling in and out. But I think this is where people can, can move into action when they understand the power of some of these foods that we could eat every single day. Totally. You know, I, 
you know, I can overdo potatoes my, myself. I know my, I know my microbial balance. Mm -hmm. So I, I do eat pot potatoes. I've been focusing on certain types. Um, mm -hmm. um, in fact, there's one that I've been uh, focusing on. Uh, everyone has heard of this by now, the Okinawan sweet potato. It's a purple sweet potato. Mm -hmm. It's okay. packed, packed with polyphenols. We can talk about high polyphenol diet because mm -hmm. um, based on the research, that is really the key uh, to avoiding yo-yo dieting. Mm -hmm. that so many people are um, are experiencing when they fast or go on any kind of reset plan. Mm -hmm. So you know these. Yeah, talk more about that because you know in my resetter group we got a lot of people that are trying to lose weight. So um, would love poly polyphenols is an important thing for them to know. Yeah, I, I, I've been. Um, researching and promoting high polyphenol diets and trying to practice what I preach. I, I'm, you know, I'm certainly not perfect. I'm, I'm like everybody else yeah. uh, and, uh, and make lots of mistakes. Um, but, you know, luckily I, I, I think I've, um, you know, learned some lessons, uh, you know, uh, you know, beginning about eight, nine years ago, I think I was heading for trouble uh, back to uh, sinking Navy ships. I think I ate enough breakfast cereal, um, in my first 50 years of life to sink a Navy ship. So, <laughs> yep. so, um, so, you know, there, there are two types of, um, of polyphenols in the flavonoid family and flavanones they're called that were found to help people avoid the yo-yo diet. And, um, you know, we should talk with Oprah Winfrey about, about this. Cause she's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we, I keep saying, I, I want her to call me. I want to help her. I can help her. Yeah, yeah, we need to get we need to get on her show. That's I mean, right, agreed. Or maybe she'll she'll help us produce our, our documentary. We can there you go. Yeah. So, um, so there there are two. They're they're called apigenin and naringenin. Um, okay. This is what um, some Israeli scientists um, came out with a couple of years ago, and they found that when these po particular types of polyphenols were were fed, um, it was it was a mouse study, um, but but it helped. Um, them avoid the yo-yo diet. Okay. And these polyphenols are feeding the protective microbes. So, so when you're fasting or on a ketogenic diet, you are shifting flora in the right direction. Even the fasting mimicking diet. Um, mm -hmm. um, Walter Longo just published a paper a couple weeks ago where he's launched into the field of the microbiome mm -hmm. and published, uh, I think it might have been his first paper, talking about how um, FMD, the fasting mimicking diet, raised lactobacillus and bifidobacteria yeah. as as a mechanism for, of success, yeah. and and this was um, contrasted with the water fast only diet, and there were benefits um, past the water fast only diet. So if you're fasting, for instance, with with um, you know water only, you are shifting flora in the right direction, but mm -hmm. long term you're not feeding those protective microbes that are required to keep that weight off or to keep your metabolism um, working properly so that you can feel good in all ways, you know, especially uh, mental health. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, have you tried Prolon? Have you done the fast mimicking diet that he has? Oh, yeah. No. It's interesting. It's very fibery. It's definitely full of fiber. And mm -hmm. if you have something, if you have SIBO, like classic SIBO, it can be a little damaging. Um, to like, but if you don't have classic SIBO, it can be, it's incredible. So, um, mm -hmm. and his research is impressive. So, no. yeah. So what are some of the foods that you can add in for the yo-yo dieter? Talk about it. Ap apigenin, some of the, um, some of the foods are parsley, uh, thyme, chamomile, uh, red pepper, dates. I happen mm -hmm. to think dates, dates seem like a safe way to, uh, to tackle a sugar addiction. If you need mm -hmm. something, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, I think you can overdo dates just like you can honey. In fact, mm -hmm. I won't even buy honey anymore because I know I'll, I'll use it up too quickly um, mm -hmm. and it's counterproductive. Um, but dates have these polyphenols um, um, in the apigenin family. Um, another one is, is celery. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So celery juice may not work so well. Yeah, didn't it, you just post something about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, saw, I saw that. Someone wrote an article, celery juice uh, is not going to help you, but it's not going to hurt you either. Right. Um, but they did make note um, that you need all the fiber that goes with the, the, mm -hmm. the plant. So 
So that's juicing versus actually using the entire plant. Yeah. Um, and um, so these are some examples of, of apigenin. And then naringenin, that's mainly uh, citrus fruits. So mm -hmm. what grapefruit is known to be very high in, in naringenin. Mm -hmm. And um, that made me wonder about why is grapefruit so contraindicated with so many pharmace pharmaceutical drugs? Have you noticed, noticed that? Interesting. Yeah, what's, what's really behind that? What's the mechanism for grapefruit wreaking havoc? You know, the poor little grapefruit has taken such a beating. Um, right. Um, you know, so maybe it's because of the way our microbes are metabolizing. Um, Interesting. Polyphenols and affecting mm -hmm. metabolism and combined with the pharmaceutical. In fact, there are so many papers now that show that pharmaceutical drugs themselves, like including even the number one uh, diabetes med, metformin, the, the mechanism just might be by, by way of gut microbes. Every, everything we place in our mouths is, is used first by our microbes. And they're basically preparing these things for, for our absorption and use. Yep. Um, and uh, but they're also doing it for themselves. So we're, we're competing in a sense and working with our microbes for this, for this pool of nutrients. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so it's about time we work with them rather than against them. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know what? It's so interesting what you say about grapefruit because uh, as a 49 year old woman, I've done a lot of research recently on perimenopause and menopause and what causes women to have really intense symptoms as they go through those years. And mm -hmm. the keto diet can be amazing for perimenopause and for that transition. But where it falls short is mm -hmm. that certain foods that raise progesterone, like uh, citrus fruits, you typically aren't going to see a lot of people that are very strict on keto go have uh, uh, oranges and grapefruits and things like that. And I think that is it becomes a very a key missing part of uh, the keto diet. This is why I always call it keto biotic, because I really want people to understand that they have to be going after many of the foods you just decided or just talked about. I also think variation is key. We, you know, when you're feeding your microbiome, you can't just keep feeding it the same thing all the time. You got to have variety. Yeah. You know, back to potatoes real briefly. There's mm -hmm. something called the potato hack diet where people only eat potatoes and they're losing weight, you know. And um, I like to think that the mechanism is raising lactobacilli. Yeah. Uh, you know, and people are, you know, have, have used potato juice, for instance. You know, it's a similar kind of thing uh, with sauerkraut. Um, yep. And you talk about, uh, about perimenopause. I, I've known people going on reset diets. Um, one that we promote on the Gut Club is called Cell Reset. It's very, um, it, it's very popular in Europe, mm -hmm. and it, it's you know, the first week is all um, carnivore, and then you you add in vegetables later. But you're you're excluding um, all the starchy vegetables and uh, and grains and sugar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but I've I've talked to people that have reversed hot flashes based oh. on that. And I've even heard, you know, that you know, someone with uh, anorexia gained weight and, and became fertile and had a baby. Um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Well, infertility is a whole nother discussion on, you know, the toxic world we live in and how it's, it's causing so much infertility. So, yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. So let's do this because I, um, I want to make sure I get enough time to address my specific questions Okay. Um, that my resetters had. So one of the things, and Sequoia and I talk about this a lot as well, is um, eating local from like your local farmers compared to food that maybe has been flown in from another country or shipped in a truck. What, what's the impact of local produce on our microbiome compared to non-local? Well, I like to, to uh, shop at the green markets. In fact, um, there are local people here that are growing these Okinawan sweet potatoes that are associated with longevity on the island of Okinawa um, in Japan. And, um, and their diet, you know, it's controversial, but there's plenty of, of uh, backing to, in the historical literature that shows that they were eating a very high amount of these uh, purple uh, sweet potatoes. In mm -hmm. fact, in 1979, by weight, it was something like 80 or 90 percent of, of the diet. Um, but you know, if you're if you're buying local, 
you know, hopefully you're, you're able to work directly with the farmer and mm -hmm. uh, make sure it's organic and, mm -hmm. uh, and keeping out the, you know, the pesticides. Yeah. I, I think it's worth every penny to do that. Yeah. And I think that's such a crucial point. We, we used to believe as a culture that organic was like for the hippie person that was just overly obsessed with their health. And now, I mean, what I would say is that organic is life-saving. If you want to extend your life, if you want to prevent disease in my book, it is the number one thing you need to do that when you're eating not, uh, when you're eating conventionally sprayed produce, you're just getting a salad full of toxins that are killing your microbiome, uh, affecting your hormones. So I, I would absolutely agree that organic has to be the number one rule of food health. And hopefully you're working with a, you know, when you're buying locally and you know where it's grown, you're working with a, a farm that's not part of, uh, you know, the EPA's biosolids program yeah. where they're using sewage sludge on farms. That's, that's a big problem. Or, or, you know, even some organic foods um, are grown by farmers using non-organic, say, chicken manure. Um, yep. So I'd like to see someone do an expose on that. That would be interesting. I know. I know. It's our food is so, it's so sad, so sad. So, um, okay, here's another interesting. Uh, let's talk about um, how quickly the microbiome will repair. So if I'm listening to this and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been eating non-organic forever. I've been on six rounds of antibiotics. I'm just coming to this information brand new. How yeah. quickly it, from your research do you think the microbiome can repair? Well, it's, it's known to be very rapid, but long-term is, is the key. And mm -hmm. the first thing to do is get tested. I know in your mm -hmm. practice, you, You've been using what the gut zoomer. Uh, yeah, I like the gut zoomer. Yeah, there's. I think it's a good test too. Mm -hmm. um, we've been promoting uh, Ubiome mm -hmm. testing and Thrive testing. Mm -hmm. It gives a very broad um, view, and we can see the actual numbers and you know the ratios involved. And that will, you know, you know, it's after looking at so many of them, I, it dawns on me that that we can put together a personalized protocol based on those figures. And you should see these test results. They can be all over the board. Um, yep. you, know, you, you can have high you know, levels of Firmicutes, which, are, which is mainly Clostridia, or you can have the opposite, and it's high Bacteroides, the gram-negative bacteria. Um, and, you know, so you know, are you familiar with the WALS protocol? Uh-huh, yep. The WALS, it's a high dose yep. Vegetable diet. Yeah, she does. And just for my audience, Terry Walls reversed uh, MS using, uh, I think she does nine cups of vegetables a day. Right, right. So, yeah. high vegetable yeah. diet. And, but I've also, you know, understood that only it only works in 50% of those who try it. Have you heard that? Huh. So, 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 it got me wondering why does it work for some people and not for others? And, um, you know, my theory is that the people that it's working for are skewed toward bacteroides, gram-negative mm -hmm. bacteria, and they need to feed their protective microbes uh, in, in Firmicutes, the, the Clostridia and, and Lactobacilli, um, and, and other you know, bacteria like Bifidobacteria with this high-dose vegetable diet. Mm -hmm. But people that are already have an overgrowth of those so-called protective microbes, Clostridia, in fact, it's in, in many autism cases, um, they, they even uh, have been testing, you know, things like vancomycin, the antibiotic, to address autism um, in those with clostridium overgrowth. Interesting. And, and it, yeah. it does reverse the symptoms, but only temporarily. And people are assuming it's because it's killing the clostridia. And because they're, they're spore-forming bacteria, they then have an opportunity to grow back when you're not using the antibiotic. That's yeah. not really the way I see it. I, um, my, my feeling is what's happening is um, the the antibiotic is actually affecting mitochondria, which were once bacteria, and they're balancing the cell. Um, so mm -hmm. that's another subject of mitochondrial dysfunction. Oh yeah, uh, I could talk. That's another topic I could talk all day about. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, I think it brings up a really interesting point, which is I, I understand the need for simplicity with our health plans. I understand that when we see the information or we see a friend that's doing really well with a health program, we wanted we assume that we would do the same, that our body would benefit from the same. 
And I love this idea that's emerging around personalized healthcare, that because our microbiome is so different, because our toxic load is so different, it's not always as simple as just going on to one diet that it appears everybody is benefiting from. So when you said that about the ter about Wall's protocol, I'm like, yeah, there it is again. Mm. It's it's that's where c getting coached, understanding your microbiome through one of these tests um, really helps you customize it for you. So back to Whole Foods, we're in the we're in the aisle um, with the greens. By the way, I'm a big promoter of greens. In particular, uh, I hope we're standing in front of the, the arugula and the water trout. <laughs> Deal, we can do it. We can stand in front of there. <laughs> Great. So we're, gonna, we're, we're in front of the, uh, the water crust now. And, then, and, which, and by the way, arugula has a very special microbiome itself. Um, mm. and, and these two are actually in the family of cruciferous vegetables. You, you know, people normally think of these greens as, um, as dark leafy greens. But they're really, you know, in the brassica family, the, the cruciferous vegetables like, like cabbage and and uh, broccoli, and mm -hmm. uh, and arugula. I, I found one really exciting piece of research that found that arugula had a different microbiome than than you know compared to the other cruciferous vegetables, and mm -hmm. it was attributed to the the phytochemicals, the polyphenols in arugula. So mm -hmm. I like to promote use of, in particular, arugula and, and watercress. There's a crescent type of watercress um, that's not quite as bitter as, uh, as the traditional watercress that is probably you know, offering some similar, if not you know, equal health benefits. So, so what else? go ahead. Watercress is really, I mean, all of that, when I make a salad, I, I put so many different types of lettuces in there because it, like your point is, is, in, is incredibly important, which is, there are so many different resources that nature has given us to help grow these microbiome. And so instead of going and buying iceberg lettuce or even the always buying the same spring mix that you get at Whole Foods, if mm. you can bring in some variety, that is so important for your gut bacteria. Yeah, that's another reason to make a trip to your Saturday morning green market. Yeah. Because you can find some really, it's like night and day compared to what you would find, you know, in a, in a supermarket here. Yeah, it, absolutely. It, all has to do with the soil health. Yeah. Um, you know, there's one study that showed that you know that the microbes were responsible for levels of vitamin C in strawberries. You know, so interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And soil microbiota are another topic. I don't know if we have time to get into it. I last year I self-published a children's book about rain-making bacteria that live on plants and in the soil, and they float up into the clouds where they are, have the ability to freeze water. Um, and without the, the bacteria in the clouds, it wouldn't rain or snow. Mm -hmm. So Wow. Yeah. wow. Yeah, I mean, we're so connected to nature. This is the thing is like, we're yeah. so, uh, the fact that we don't honor and take amazing care of nature is ridiculous to me because it's keeping us alive. And yes. when you hear things like that, you're like, why, why are we not waking up to this? I mean, I know people are, but it's, that is such a crucial point. And yeah. Um, what's it called? Uh, regenerative agriculture is now really becoming um, a topic. I hear in the circles that I'm in, um, people talking more and more about how we got to go. It's more than just eating the right foods. We got to go back to the soil health and look at what's going on in those soils. Right. And that's, you know, back to glyphosate again, it's, you know, it's, it's changing um, our farmland basically. Yeah. So yeah. that may be one big reason why our food is not as nutritious as it once was, um, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. And, and uh, you know, these soil microbes are also probably more important uh, than fossil fuels when it comes to climate change because they're holding the CO2 in the soil. Interesting. Uh, by far, much more than, than anything we can put in the air with fossil fuels. So, you know, this becomes a climate issue as well. Right. Um, so back to Whole Foods. Yes. Um, I would say, Dr. Mindy, I would like to see your stool test results. <laughs> yes, and that will tell me how my food is working for me. Right, and then and then yeah. we can talk about ways to balance that. Yeah. For instance, for some people, a carnivore diet may work well. For others, a high dose vegetable diet may be more appropriate. Right. Um, and you know, before you know, I, I know our hour is almost over. I want to talk a little bit about the microbiome vaccine safety project because it's the Please. same same issue. Um, yeah. It's the microbes present 
at time of vaccination that are guiding the immune response. And this has never been factored by the vaccine industry. Um, yeah. and we just, uh, um, we have a paper now in press. So I have a, a co-author who's a vaccine scientist um, at Virginia Tech. And, um, and uh, her lab has already demonstrated the protective effects of microbes. And, and the vaccine industry has, has for more than 10 years known that microbes are actually guiding immune response and are responsible for whether or not vaccines fail um, or, or vaccine efficacy. Yeah, um, interesting. So, in, you know, in a place that, that is suffering from poor sanitation, um, vaccines don't stand a chance because of imbalanced gut flora, so they fail. But what the industry has never done yet is provided any research that shows that this issue may be associated with adverse vaccine reaction. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something I've been publishing articles about since 2014 and talking about it on, on uh, my personal Facebook page um, since like 2011, because mm -hmm. I, I, I was clued into this by, uh, by my dog's uh, issues too. I, I thought mm -hmm. that was the vaccine injury. Um, yeah. It was combined with being, um, you know, having a gut problem from swimming in a local lake that was sewage contaminated. Yeah. So, you know, she was vaccinated at the time of having a gut imbalance and ended up with a seizure disorder a few weeks after the vaccine. Yeah. So, yeah. And talk a little bit about you have a um, you have a, a documentary that you're going to you're doing or you're being interviewed on that well, brings this subject to light. Well, we're, we're just um, now beginning to raise funds for this documentary. Um, the working title is The Science of Microbes. And the director of the film is Kendall Nelson who uh, made a very well-known film called um, The Greater Good, produced mm -hmm. in 2011. Yeah. And, um, and she uh, contacted me uh, to, uh, you know, with interest in making a documentary about microbiota. Um, mm -hmm. And just recently, um, you know, I may as well share this big news now because it's World Autism Awareness Day, the filmmaker Andrew Wakefield has joined us on this project. That's awesome, so, that's awesome. That's, that's gonna be something else. Um, Hopefully we can make it happen. Um, and uh, we may even be able to incorporate the uh, vaccine safety research that is described in the paper that's now in press about um, whether or not gut microbes mediate adverse vaccine reaction. Yeah. That's yeah, idea. it would make sense because why would why can one child get a set of vaccines and be fine and another child gets one vaccine and now they've got a, a, some kind of damage. So it's it all goes back to that microbiome again. We are diverse in our microbiome. So we can't be linear in our thought process that medication of any kind is gonna act similarly in every single person. Right, it's not a one size fits all proposition. Not, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but that's the way the vaccine industry is treating the world at this point. And yeah. they to say, there's no biological plausibility for vaccine-induced autism. I like to think there's plenty when you factor the gut microbiota brain connection. Okay, yeah. this, is a, this is a big deal. Um, and, and people are, as I said earlier, becoming painfully aware of this. And there's so many issues. You know, you look at the gut brain connection, um, one of which would be the vagus nerve. That's a really mm -hmm. important, uh, important one, of course. And, um, you know, it, Something that's flabbergasting, I think, is that 90% of the communication um, between the gut and the brain uh, on the vagus is from the gut to the brain. Only 10% is the brain to, to the gut. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, people are using things like CBD um, and, uh, you know, and uh, cannabinoids to affect the brain. And, you know, these, these can cannabinoid receptors are actually in the gut. And I think the long-term solution are lactobacillus bacteria because the lactobacilli are, you know, there's crosstalk between uh, lactobacillus, for instance, and cannabinoid receptors. And that's how the uh, effect is through the vagus nerve to the brain. Yeah, and, and from there you have oxytocin receptors that are upregulated and, and you have more of them uh, due to the lactobacilli. There's research showing that. And, you know, and then, you know, that raised oxytocin is actually, you know, we're getting back to the spiritual side of things again. That, that's about empathy. Um, yeah. And, um, 
and having a, you know, so maybe that's why fasting has roots in uh, religion and mm -hmm. raising that, that spiritual connection to uh, the world outside of us. That's why I think I love that. microbes are a window to, to yeah. that world. Uh, I, I love that. So recently I interviewed Dr. Anna Kabeca on uh, Resetter TV and mm -hmm. she's all about hormones and her she was explaining that oxytocin is the master hormone that when you raise oxytocin, what you do is you lower cortisol. And when you lower cortisol, you start to balance things like estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. So if you're over here dealing with hormonal imbalances, it's not as simple as throwing medication there. You've got to look at at oxytocin really being the major the major player of all of those. And then you just gave me another like a deeper level of that, which is and your gut bacteria influence oxytocin. So right. that that was awesome. There's plenty of research uh, to back that up. Uh, um, you know. I rarely make things up. But when I do, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, that's why I wanted to bring you on. It, and I think it's my heart goes out to people as they understand this: is who do you believe? Where's the fake news? And I tell you, go to the Gut Club because when he posts an article, it's legit. This is not made up stuff. This is not somebody's opinion of a study. These are legitimate studies that have been well vetted. Um, by Keith and by other people. So there's enough, like you said, there's enough research out there. Um, so before I forget, there's some uh, really interesting connection between the oxytocin in the brain and how it can raise what's uh, known as the bliss molecule, anandamide, which is mm -hmm. a very important uh, cannabinoid. Um, and um, you know, so you have the love hormone uh, interacting with the bliss molecule. I like that's very poetic. Love that. Yeah. So, okay. So then now again, let's go back into the mindset of someone just learning all of this. So if I want to get those bacteria in my gut to help get more stimulation of the vagus nerve, get more oxytocin, is that as simple as taking a probiotic and just hoping for the best or, or what, how do I go about doing that? Yeah. I, th I think that's where it becomes almost more art than science because yes. you have to, you have to be your own um, you know, self-advocate these days. Yeah. You know, most doctors, we, we have a lot of people in the gut club school test discussion group who are professionals in the field, just beginning to learn how to interpret um, yeah. a school test chart. Yeah. And um, so, and, and there are so many options to, uh, to helpfully, you know, shift flora in the right direction. There's so many things that you can do in the world of prebiotics, probiotics, probiotic enema, fecal microbiota transplant in desperate cases. Um, even, I, I, in fact, I have uh, something that I, we're gonna be launching soon, the breastfed uh, baby poop project. I happen to think that, that, that breastfed baby poop might be some of the best medicine out there and might be uh, very good for school test. Uh, Interesting. Uh, FMT donors, because a healthy breastfed, hopefully unvaccinated baby um, has 80% bifidobacteria and very healthy phages as well. In fact, um, in the beginning of life, the phages, which are the healthy viruses that keep gram negative bacteria and other and even gram positive bacteria under control, they outnumber the bacteria, these healthy viruses. So you know, what was once thought of as the enemy is actually, you know, our friend. And, and so phages are known now to be an alternative to antibiotics. Yeah, we use we do we do phage therapy in my office um, oh. when when we see it as and we can use it as a killer, but it's not really a killer. Um, it actually, you know, it'll go in there and help take care of the of the pathogen. But it, the beauty is, it's to me, it's like it's like the perfect antibiotic because it will kill the bad and grow the good, whereas an antibiotic just kills everything. That's right. That's right, and that's that's not a good thing. And Obviously, um, yeah, obviously, it's not a good thing. But the the phages that are on the market now are targeting E. coli, uh, and you know, so in some cases, E. coli uh, are actually healthy. The type certain certain mm -hmm. types, others are pathogenic. The, the adhesive type of E. coli, and that's where stool testing plays a big role because some types of tests, like the 16S testing, Ubiome and and uh, thrive, uh, you know, they're, though they're very wide ranging, they don't include E. coli. Um, they, I, there are technological uh, constraints. 
but a PCR test like uh, gut zoomer um, may not have as broad of, of a, a use um, as a ubiome test, but when you combine the two, it can be pretty powerful because the PCR test can reveal adhesive E. coli. Yeah, we've caught a lot of E. coli. Um, I've caught a lot of uh, Klebsiella, uh, Candida, of course, uh, from the gut zoomer, but there are some really interesting uh, um, bacteria that you catch on that gut zoomer. I like yeah. that thought, though, combining the two is interesting. Oh, yeah. You, the more the merrier. You know, people right. like to think, oh, this test is better. That's not the way it is. It's, it's the more information you have, the, the better chance you have of putting a strategy together that works. Right, right, right. So, so let's finish with this thought. Um, I love the food uh, ideas that you gave us. And in fact, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take some of those, the foods that you listed, like the um, Okinawa sweet potato and the arugula, I'm gonna make a list. And for you resetters, I'll put it in the resetter tribe um, and make sure you guys have that list. Um, but what can I do just an overall on a day-to-day -day basis? I hope people walk away from this, this interview and they go, okay, I need to take better care of my, of my gut microbiome. I really need to think about this. Um, mm -hmm. What is a day-to-day, -day, does it look, habit look like? Is it eating fiber? Is it taking a probiotic? Is it avoiding uh, antibacterial soaps? Or is it all of that? Well, you know, maybe the most powerful thing you can do is just stop eating sugar, first of all. Oh, that's nice. That, that's a big one, you know, and, and alcohol works in similar pathways. So that that's a problem. The, the alcohol studies are, are pretty frightening. There's this relationship between the liver and, and the intestines and they, it recycles, you know, some, some of the pathways we haven't even touched on. Um, you know, our, our bodies are meant to, you know, translocate microbes, you know, from one organ to the next. And, uh, you know, there are things we can do um, to realize it all starts in the gut. That lymphatic system is another thing we, we didn't even touch on yet. But. Right. Yeah, you need, we need like like yeah. 20 hours to go through the microbiome. I mean, there's so much there. Yeah, but, but stopping uh, eating sugar would be a big thing. And, and uh, adding, adding greens um, in, in large amounts would kind of help. They, in yeah. fact, the greens are known to feed the, the healthy E. coli. Uh, yeah. E. coli can, you know, and, you know, one thing we didn't mention also is this relationship between the gut and the brain being also about amino acids. And um, mm -hmm. something I like to promote, um, the amino acids are actually regulated by gut microbes. They produce them and they degrade them. Mm -hmm. And those, those amino acids are the building blocks for our neuro neurotransmitters. Right. And they, they help decide what can cross the blood brain barrier. Yeah. So I, that's interesting, too, because I just uh, have interviewed Dr. Nasha Winters on Resetter TV, and I actually just spent the weekend with her at a conference. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about a topic that I get a lot, which is plant based diet versus ketogenic diet for cancer. And, you know, she's a cancer. She calls herself a cancer thriver um, that and she said, yeah, they're both good. But if you go only vegetarian, for cancer, you miss out on the amino acids and that you need amino acids from meats to be able to um, to have certain building blocks and to grow yourself a good back, uh, microbiome. Yeah, all these different diets, whether it's a carnivore diet or a vegan diet, have to be considered as, as medicine um, to help bring someone into balance. And they all have their place, yeah. period. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I, I could talk to you forever and we may have to do a part two of this because there's so, like we said, when we first started, there's so many paths we can go down, but what I love and I hope um, that my community gets from this is just how powerful your gut bacteria can be and how, if you're out here searching for answers to anxiety and autoimmune issues, um, you may start to turn yourself inward and search in here in that gut as the possible connection between, you know, your overall health, the conditions you're trying to treat um, are so determined by your gut bacteria. So um, thank you, Keith. And please, please go see the Gut Club. It's, it, is it just on Facebook or do you have a website? Uh, thegutclub.org on the, on the internet. And Great. then we, we have the, the Gut Club on Facebook and the Gut Club School Test Discussion Group. Awesome. 
Great. And we, I mean, we learn so much from your your work and you posting your articles. I mean, that's part of why I had to bring you on. I was like, this guy is just knows his stuff. He's posting really relevant information. So um, thank you for the good work you're doing. Same to you, uh, Dr. Mindy. And I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan and, um, and uh, both you and Sequoia. Yeah, uh, thank you. You're bringing such great stuff to the world. And thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. Here. Yeah, my yeah, my pleasure. And I know our paths will will keep crossing in this world uh, of health and and nutrition. Um, and it is an exciting time. It's a really exciting time where people are waking up. And the the most exciting time is that you know platforms like yours and mine can now give people solutions. So, um, so thank you. When people become connected with the web of life, we can really make change. I agree. Love it. I love it. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Dr. Mindy. Uh -huh. Hey, Dr. Mindy here, and if you enjoyed this video, please share it out to the world. I'm trying to get really cutting edge health information into people's hands. And if you wanna see more videos like this, just subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates as to when I go live and new videos that I put out there. Every Thursday, by the way, I do a live video from here and answer your questions. So if there are questions you want me to answer, join me then and I'll make sure that I address them. Thanks, have an awesome day.